Lorcan is the spirit of Nern, the god of all mortals. This does not mean all mortals necessarily like him or even know him. Most elves hate him, thinking creation is the act which sundered them from the spirit realm. Most humans revere him, or aspects of him, as the herald of existence. The creation of the mortal plane, Mundus, Nern, is a source of mental anguish to all living things. All souls know deep down they came originally from somewhere else, and that Nern is a cruel and crucial step to what comes next. What is this next? Some wish to return to the original state, the spirit realm, and think that Lorcan is the demon that hinders their way. To them, Nern is a prison, an illusion to escape. Others think that Lorcan created the world as the testing ground for transcendence. To them, the spirit realm was already a prison, and that true escape is now finally possible. Whatever Lorcan's role may be in the lives of mortals, the great mystery remains unchanged. The spirit of Nern may be a polarizing figure, but the reality of mortality persists whether you love Lorcan or loathe him. It is the question all mortals, regardless of what universe they hail from, begin asking themselves the moment their minds develop enough to ponder. We may not remember it, but every man, elf and beast reaches that pivotal moment where we realise our parents aren't all-knowing, all-powerful beings. In truth, they're just as clueless as us, only they have even more questions. Another concept that spans all universes is that of reaching enlightenment, of securing eternal life, preserving the soul when our frail physical forms inevitably fail us. Unfortunately, as far as our world is concerned, you won't find the answers to these questions in one of my videos. If you could, I'd be practically a god, and this video would probably make it into the trending section of YouTube. But I do have some good news. I may not be able to share the secrets to real-world immortality with you today, but I can do the next best thing. While it is very complicated in sections, and the sources are often quite cryptic, there is a lot of information pertaining to the pursuit of immortality in the Elder Scrolls universe. Mortals from Mundus have actually achieved immortality successfully, and there are a multitude of pathways. Some use mysterious magics, some deal with profane powers, while others seek enlightenment through spiritual soul-searching. By the end of this video, you'll know everything there is to know about the many methods of achieving immortality in the Elder Scrolls. Soon, your player character will have the knowledge to ascend to godhood, to sit alongside the Aedra, basking in the glory of divinity. Hey guys, it's Drew here and welcome back to Fudge Muppet. You've probably figured by this point, or by looking at the length of the video, that this topic is a hefty one. We can't really cut corners when it comes to a subject like immortality, and there are so many interpretations of life and death across the many cultures of Tamriel, so I guess we ought to get started. To understand immortality, it's important to understand the many varying stories of creation. Knowing what separates man from God is the first step in the pursuit of immortality. The monomyth and the annuad give us an overview of the accepted theories for the birth of mortals. In essence, everything began with two opposing forces. One was stasis, the force of order, commonly known as Anu, while the other was change, the force of chaos, commonly called Padamai. The intermingling of these forces facilitated the creation of the universe. Imagine it this way, Anu is an everlasting, ineffable light, so bright and brilliant that the endless void is a constant state of illumination. Like the sun's incandescence rolling across an endless, perfectly flat expanse. Anu's light is glorious, but, may the gods forgive me for saying it, rather bland. What's light without darkness? Without contrast, there's nothing to appreciate. And that's where Padamai comes into play. He is the obstacle, countless obstacles that dot the expanse. When Anu's light hits Padamai's shapes, their interplay creates shadows. And that's how you have change, diversity and variation. And from this coupling, all the forces that make up the universe are conceived. The intermingled blood of Anu and Padamai led to the birth of the Atada, the original spirits, the Aedra and Daedra. The Elnafe, the ancestors to the mortal races, were a group of Atada. 
What differs from culture to culture is how the Elnafe degenerated into mortals, and who is responsible for this transformation. We'll dive into more about creation and the gods when talking about specific means of achieving immortality. But with the foundation set, let's talk about the not-so-theological means of achieving eternal life. Immortality is undoubtedly connected to spirituality, the gods and the rules of the universe, and exploring those topics will make up the bulk of this video. But before we tackle those, it is worth mentioning that immortality of the body can be achieved without sparing so much as a thought for the nature of existence. These methods are somewhat shallow and come with drawbacks and flaws, but this is a comprehensive guide, and anything that extends a mortal's lifespan warrants a mention. Everybody knows that vampires vampires exist on Tamriel. Around the campfire, travellers tell terrible tales of the Bosmeri Telboff vampires, who feast on children exclusively. And how about the frozen Volkahar vampires of the north, who sick death hounds upon their prey? You'd think only fools would actively seek out the sanguinaire vampiris disease. Why would you willingly become weak to sunlight and a slave to bestial insatiable blood cravings? Well, vampires are undead beings, and as a result, are entirely immune to disease and aging. So, if you define immortality as simply not growing old and decaying, then contracting vampirism is a relatively easy way to become immortal. But don't get cocky just because you can't die of old age, as just about anything else can still kill you. If a vampire's head is chopped off, they're as dead as any other mortal. There's another disease that has the bizarre side effect of eternal life. This disease was created by Dagoth Ur and spread across Morrowind. It is known as Corpus, the skin blight, or the divine disease. Those who contract corpus experience severe mental deterioration and grotesque deformations of the body. The divine disease seems like an unusual nickname for such an affliction, doesn't it? Well, the followers of House Dagoth believe it is a blessing, and these cultists have shown similar physical symptoms, except they remain lucid and even boast a higher spiritual state. Dive Fear, the 4,000-year-old wizard will discuss more soon, also saw it as a blessing after he discovered that victims are completely immune to other diseases and don't age. So contracting corpus is a path to immortality just like vampirism, only there's a very high chance you'll live out your days as little more than a slobbering husk. Of course, there's one exception to this rule. When the Nerevarine became infected with corpus, Dive Fear developed a cure which removed all of the disease's negative effects while keeping the positive ones. So when the Nerevarine left for Akavir, he did so with immunity to all diseases, increased strength and endurance, and immortality. Just like vampirism, this doesn't prevent death altogether, but with increased strength and endurance, someone cured of corpus is about as close to immortality as we've seen so far. The Nerevarine is the only known example of a cured patient. Perhaps Dive Fear has cured others since then, but it's also possible that this is the only instance in which the cure worked successfully. So far, our road to immortality has taken us to undead bloodsuckers and mindless zombies. The next method isn't too different, as once again, you'll need to become a soulless undead creature. But in return, you'll be extremely powerful and intelligent. Liches are expert necromancers, and this is a requirement for any mortal hoping to learn the secrets of lichdom. Necromancy usually involves the reanimation of another dead mortal, but liches take this skill and apply it to themselves. They place their souls in repositories called phylacteries, and then undergo their transformation. Once the transference is complete, the vessel becomes obsolete, and the lich is born, or should I say, reborn. The souls of innocence are also required for the time-consuming transformation process. Achieving lichdom isn't easy, and few truly understand the secrets of succeeding. As a result, liches are seldom seen in Tamriel. In essence though, the separation of one's soul from their body removes the boundaries placed on mortal will by one's soul. Some liches go mad in the process, as their psyches are torn apart in the phylactery. It also seems to be the case that results of achieving lichdom may vary. Manamarco, the King of Worms, is said to be the first mortal to achieve lichdom. And he is a perfect example of the heights of being a lich. 
On the other hand, what exactly constitutes a lich isn't perfectly clear. Dragon priests share a lot of similarities to liches, and they draw their power from their draugr servants. The Aelids of old also seem to have liches, which calls into question the notion that Manamarco was the first. But I'm not here to discuss the semantics of the law. Becoming a lich is a method of achieving immortality, but it is a risky one, and you could argue that it relies on dying and becoming undead to properly achieve lichdom at all. At this point you must be wondering, can you not achieve immortality without catching a disease or becoming undead? Well, you could become a Hagraven. It is believed that some witches undergo bizarre rituals to exchange their humanity for access to powerful perverted magics. What exactly these magics are isn't clear. They are revered as matriarchal sorcerers to the Reachmen, and can create briar hearts. But if we look at the Glen Moral Coven of witches, who were active in the late Third Era, some of these witches chose to become Hagravens, and they live to the present day of the Fourth Era 201. It seems that undergoing this transformation allowed the Glenmoral Hagravens to extend their lives by over 200 years. While we can't say exactly what the life expectancy is for a Hagraven, there is certainly some kind of anti-aging magic or alchemy at play. It's hard to tell because they look so hideous. But of course, becoming a Hagraven isn't a huge step up from diseased or undead. So how about magic that extends life without making you a disgusting creature? There are a few esoteric groups who seem to have developed some means of extending their lifespans. Of course, the races of Tamriel have varying lifespans already. Humans, orcs and beasts will live 80 to 100 years before dying of old age, while the elven races can live over twice that long, growing as old as 300. These numbers are debatable, as there really aren't concrete sources, and there are a handful of mortals who defy these life expectancies. The Telvanni are a perfect example. Unfortunately, the wizard lords of House Telvanni are reclusive individuals. They traditionally isolate themselves, pursuing wisdom and mastery in solitude. For the most part, they have no interest in the goings-on of Morrowind and Tamriel Greater. Many Telvanni mages lose interest in anything and anyone outside of their own mushroom tower. Their arcane pursuits, therefore, remain an utter mystery to outsiders. Vivek describes them as iconoclastic, profane and unconventional. Dive Fear is a Telvanni sorcerer, and was 4,000 years old at the end of the Third Era, and he didn't look remotely frail or decrepit. Another Telvanni wizard named Nelof also seems to be very old. We don't have any proof of his age, but we do know a few things. Nelof is alive and sprightly in the 201st year of the Fourth Era, 206 years prior. When he is encountered by the Nerevarine, he says the following regarding Senis Findo, another Telvanni battle mage. She is a servant of Master Gofran of Telerun, and a mere child of 200 years. 200 years of age is by no means young for a Dark Elf, and while this is obviously a bit of speculation on my part, Nelof's willingness to dismiss her as a mere child is either gross hyperbole or proof that he's many centuries older than her. How exactly some Telvanni wizards extend their lives so dramatically is not clear, but it doesn't appear to be necromantic in nature. The Dunma are very culturally sensitive when it comes to the dead. They generally will not abide desecration, and I think that applies even to the renegade minds of House Telvanni. But they are not the only ones who seem to have unearthed secrets which extend mortal life. The Sigic Order are perhaps even more enigmatic than the Telvanni, and I'd once again say it's extremely unlikely that the Sigics use any form of necromancy. After all, one promising student named Manamarco was using mysticism to manipulate souls and the dead on the Isle of Arteum. His peers considered his practices to be profane, and he was encouraged to leave. The Sigic Order is devoted to the obscure magic of mysticism, and if they have discovered the means to live long lives, it would almost certainly be through the use of this school of magic. According to a letter written to the Rite Master of the Sigic Order, Dive Fear had actually spent time with the Order on Arteum, so there's a good chance his long lifespan was achieved in part from his time studying with the Sigic monks. Sofa Sil describes mysticism as a magic that allows an individual to see an object's true meaning. There are layers to understanding all things, said Sofa Sil. The common man looks at an object and fits it into a place in his way of thinking. Those skilled in the old ways, in the ways of the Sigic, in mysticism, can see an object and identify it by its proper role. But one more layer is needed to be peeled back to achieve understanding. You must identify the object by its role and its truth, and interpret that meaning. 
While this description is interesting, it makes mysticism no less complex. Yet this description of the magic seems relevant to me. This unique approach to understanding the laws of physics could in fact be the gateway to altering a mortal's physical state, to combating the aging process. But that is also speculation, as the secrets of the Sijic are too well guarded for an inferior human like me to be privy to. It also seems as though the Falmer Snow Elves, at least a few of them, had access to some kind of magical knowledge that prolonged their lifespans. Take a look at one of the last remaining Snow Elves of the Forgotten Vale, Knight Paladin Gelabor. He is one of the two known survivors of the war with Isgrimors at Morans in the First Era, and he wasn't disfigured by the Dwemer. He would be approximately 4,000 years old. Perhaps he used some kind of magic, or perhaps he was blessed by Auriel and given eternal life. All of the forms of immortality so far have come with many stipulations, or have only achieved longer lives rather than true immortality. But there is one final way to cheat death before we get onto the topic of divinity, and this one relates to the realms of Oblivion and their Daedra Lords. In the mortal realm of Mundus, most cultures acknowledge the significance of the Time God. Whether they call him Auriel, Akatosh, Alkosh, or Alduin, the Dragon God of Time guarantees the passage of time and the cycle of life and death. In Oblivion, these rules don't apply. Time progresses on the whim of the Lord who controls the realm. So if a mortal lives in Oblivion, they can completely avoid aging, so long as they stay in the Prince's good books, of course. A Daedra Lord could choose to age you 100 years in 10 seconds in their realm, so be careful seeking immortality with this trick. The first dragonborn, Merak, was born in the Merefic Era, and lived over 4,000 years in Apocrypha, before he was slain by the last dragonborn. It is possible that Hermaeus Mora simply granted Merak immortality in exchange for his loyal service. But at the same time, so long as he lives in oblivion, there's no reason why Merak would age at all. Another example is Dervanin, the Bosmeri High Priest of Mania and servant of Sheagorath. It is possible that he is just an extremely old elf, but he can be encountered during the Oblivion Crisis, and 201 years later in Skyrim. On both occasions he is a grown adult. It seems likely that his time in Oblivion helped him live so long. Another of Sheagorath's servants supports this in the ESO Loremasters archive. Chamberlain Haskell says, Let me be clear, inhabitants of the Shivering Isles are affected by time, but we are not subject to it. We are subjects of Lord Sheagorath who subjects us to whatever subjects he is in the mood to subjugate, because time is subjective. In the Shivering Isles, we find another means to achieve an unusual form of immortality. This one isn't too well known, but the champion of Cyrodiil's time spent in the asylum proves it to be possible. This process is called mantling. A lot can be discovered about mantling from the name alone. To mantle is to envelop or shroud something, like wrapping an object in a cloak. Like this description, achieving divinity via mantling requires a subject and an object, a mortal to mantle, and an immortal to be mantled. Mantling has been described in non-canon sources as walking like them until they must walk like you. Don't worry, there's plenty of canonical evidence for mantling, but I think that line sums it up well. Mantling is the process of taking on the role of another, and then mastering the role until they inherit the power and identity that comes with that role. It's practically impossible to properly define such an ambiguous process, so I'll give some examples. Jigalag, the Prince of Order, was cursed to madness by his fellow Daedra Lords. Thus, Sheagorath was born. But once every era, Sheagorath would vanish, and Jigalag would be set free to bring order to the Shivering Isles. And this order involved completely destroying Sheagorath's realm, forcing the Mad God to rebuild it. This event is known as the Grey March. During one Grey March, the Champion of Cyrodiil defended the Shivering Isles in Sheagorath's absence. The reason Sheagorath disappeared is because he is the same god as Jigalag. So really, Jigalag is Sheagorath. But when the Champion of Cyrodiil defeated Jigalag and the Grey March failed, Jigalag was set free, and the Champion became Sheagorath, mantling the Daedric Prince. Whether or not Jigalag is defeated, Sheagorath's champion always ends the Grey March by mantling the Mad God. Sheagorath describes this process to the last Dragonborn by saying that the title of Mad God is one that gets passed down from me to myself every few thousand years. Mantling is an interesting form of apotheosis in that there seems to be a clear price. It's arguably easier than achieving enlightenment through Kim, but in exchange for immortality, you have to surrender your individuality. 
You have to become someone or something that you are not. To mantle Sheagorath, you must become the Mad God. You can't simply rule as your own Daedra Lord. The Sheagorath encountered by the last Dragonborn is the champion of Cyrodiil, yet he just seems like, well, Sheagorath. The champion became indistinguishable from the Mad God. The person he was before is essentially dead. There is another potential example of a mantled god, but to delve into his or their story would add another 10 minutes to this video. If you'd like to learn more about the mysteries of Talos, we have a dedicated video to it on the channel. I'll link it below. But Tiber Septim found a path to divinity, and this path was paved in brass, courtesy of a fascinating, brilliantly complicated race. The Dwemer are a race who were motivated by the ambition of becoming eternal. They believed their intellect could rival the gods, but they did not wish to mantle the gods, following in their footsteps. Rather, they believed they could be gods in their own right. They could create life just like the gods. Their animunculi, their enchanted mechanical guardians commonly known as centurions or spheres, could interpret the actions of people around them, in a sense, perceive their intent and respond accordingly. These automatons were galvanized and given life by steam and geothermal power, and it seems as though the Dwemer were somewhat comforted by their ability to empower lifeless fabrics into active beings. They relished in the idea that they could deny the organic power of the gods, while at the same time transcend the mortal systems of life. And this race's technological innovation culminated in the Brass Tower, the Numidium, a unique means of achieving immortality. With the right power source and the proper tools, the Numidium could channel the missing god's divine power. In the West, when the Brass Tower was in possession of Tiber Septim, the Mantella served as the power source. Once again, if you'd like more information on that, check out our video on Talos linked below. But in the land of Resdane, modern day Morrowind, a different, more profound power source was used. The very heart of the missing god, the beating doom drum of Lorcan. This means of achieving immortality seems deceptively simple. Mere proximity to the heart has peculiar effects on mortals. But to truly tap its beatific essence is to risk total devastation. And Chief Tonal Architect Kagranak of the Dwemer experienced this firsthand. With his failure to tap the heart of Lorcan, his entire race disappeared. But in the studious, meticulous hands of Sofa Sil, the tribunal arm Sivi were able to successfully attune themselves with the heart's frequencies. They channeled Lorcan's powers and became demigods. But alas, even this method of reaching immortality was not perfect. Their godhood relied on annual visits to the heart. These pilgrimages renewed their powers, and when they were ultimately cut off from the Doom Drum's power, their gifts waned. So Fasil believed he could create a mechanical replacement, but his work was brought to an abrupt end when he was murdered by Almalexia. Even with the genuine physical powers bestowed upon him by the heart of Lorcan, Vivek the warrior poet was ever searching for enlightenment, for his own personal divinity, an apotheosis that wasn't tethered to something as fragile as a dead god's heart. And if I had to choose one word to define his endeavours, it would be Kim, the secret syllable of royalty. And before I go on talking about Kim, I want to give a disclaimer that this lore is incredibly vague. The canon sources are cryptic, and a lot of it is supported by non-canon texts, so take everything with a grain of salt. But this is the comprehensive guide to immortality, and Kim is an essential syllable in the search for enlightenment. In his Mythic Dawn commentaries, Mankar Cameron speaks of Kim. He says, Those who know it can reshape the land. Witness the home of the Red King once jungled. This is a reference to Tiber Septim who, once he achieved divinity as Talos, turned the heartland of Cyrodiil from dense jungle to vast open meadows. Kim is an interesting word or syllable in the Elder Scrolls universe. It is the first syllable in Kim El Adabal, which is the alid name for the red diamond in the centre of the Amulet of Kings. Vivek writes of his attempts to learn this secret syllable in his 36 lessons. In his journeys, he left Mournhold and found the first corner of the House of Troubles, Molag Bal, dwelling in a span of badlands. In Vivek's stories, the figurative and the literal tend to intertwine, so keep that in mind as I continue. Vivek seduced the Prince of Domination and married him. This all took place shortly before the fateful Battle of Red Mountain, where the Dwemer and Kaima would clash, races would vanish, and gods would be made. Vivek spoke to Molag Bal in the Elnafex language and said, Ay al Tadun Gartok Padhom. 
which I probably pronounce poorly, but roughly translates to, I am the weapon in the hands of Padamai. And with these magic words, the king of enslavement added another, Kim, which is the secret syllable of royalty. Soon after learning this syllable, Vivek was made into a demigod. But what is the significance of Kim? How can it be used to strive for immortality? Well, that is a very complicated question, and is very open to interpretation. Scott has a great video on the channel detailing Kim, as well as the concepts of Amaranth and the Godhead. I'll leave a link to it below. But I will try to distill what we know about Kim into a digestible form, if that's even possible. To achieve Kim, one must learn the true nature of existence. They must come to terms with the presence of the omnipotent Godhead. The Godhead is the preeminent force. The Godhead conjured Anu and Padamai in a dream, and everything that has ever been, is and will ever be, is part of the Godhead's dream. To achieve Kim is to accept that you, a mere mortal of Mundus, are nothing more than a tiny dream being in an enormous dream universe. You do not exist. This is speculation, but there are theories that the disappearance of the Dwemer is tied to this epiphany. The Dwemer were not dreamers, they were rational and astute. So, when faced with the reality that they do not exist, what would the Dwemer do? They would cease to exist. This theory is known as the Zero Sum. But as I said, this is only speculation, as the disappearance of the Dwemer seems to be an area of the law that Bethesda wishes to keep hidden. But I think the theory helps to demonstrate why Vivek of all people would be perfectly suited to achieving Kim. Vivek is wise, but he is not limited by pragmatism like the Dwemer. And more importantly, he has a powerful ego. Kim is a state of being which allows an individual to escape from all known laws and limitations. Kim is very much like lucid dreaming. You realise you are just part of a dream, so what do you do next? Does your dream self wake up and cease to be? Or does your dream self take control of the dream world, shaping it to suit your every whim? An individual in the state of Kim has accepted their rather insignificant role in the full scope of the universe, yet has held on to their own individuality, in defiance of the Godhead. I could go on, but I feel like this sums up Kim in a fairly understandable way. This is how you achieve immortality without subjecting yourself to disease or defamation or profane sorcery. When compared to Kim, those methods seem ridiculous. They endure so much to prolong their mortal lives, and will suffer by the rules of a fatuous dream. While with Kim, you ignore the rules, you change them, and you remain an individual in the process. Of course, there are drawbacks. If you lose focus, if your mind slips into nihilism in the face of the universe's truths, then you may just vanish and stop existing. Amaranth is an extension of Kim. It takes Kim to the next level. Simply put, Amaranth is like mantling. Only you don't mantle a god, you mantle the godhead, and become a dreamer within your own tower. Speaking of the tower, that brings us onto our final form of achieving immortality. One that is unique to the Ultima of Somerset and their beliefs. The High Elves revere Auriel and the Aedra, perhaps with the exception of Stendar, for they view him as the apologist of men. There is a fundamental difference between the way Elves and men view the Aedra. Men, for the most part, appear to be thankful to the gods for giving them life. The Elves, on the other hand, particularly the Ultima, believe they were robbed of their place in Aetherius, and trapped in mortality by Lorcan's deception. They venerate the Aedra, but they view them as ancestors rather than higher disconnected beings. In their eyes, Lorcan tricked their ancestors into building the mortal realm, thus dooming them to degenerate into weak, finite beings. There is a well-supported theory that the political leaders of the Somerset Isles have a hidden agenda. The Old Mary Dominion have been spreading their influence across Tamriel, weakening the Empire of Men, and it is speculated that the Falmor have discovered a means to undo creation, to unravel the neatly woven strands of Lorcan's created realm. If they can undo creation, the Elves can then take back their place in Aetherius, alongside the Aedra where they belong. This is their way of achieving immortality, and the only things that stand in their way are the towers. The towers are the foundations of the mortal realm. Without them, the mortal realm would hypothetically collapse. It is said that the Orbis, the universe, is a wheel. The spokes are the earth bones of the eight divines. Aetherius is the rim of the wheel. The spaces between the spokes is the chaos of oblivion. And the center is Mundus. Were you to escape the confines of the wheel and view it from a different angle, from the side, you would see a line. You see I, a capital I. 
Vivek calls this the secret tower, the shape of the only name of God, I. The first person I, referring to the individual, is symbolic of achieving Kim and becoming a god. But enough of the secret tower. How about the towers that aren't hidden? What about the towers that serve as the wonders of the mortal realm? It is believed there are eight in total, the same as the number of spokes on the wheel. Where each spoke meets the hub, there is a tower, and each tower has a stone which powers it. There may be more towers, but it seems as though there are eight, excepting the secret tower. The first tower, the primordial tower, is Adamantia, the Adamantine Tower. Legends tell that time began here. It is called the first unassailable spike of reality in the dawn, and it was the site of the convention. This tower resides on Isle Balfiera in the Iliac Bay, and it is powered by the Zero Stone. Then there's the Red Tower, Red Mountain, which formed as a result of the convention. When Lorcan was punished for his trickery, Trinomac ripped out his heart. But when Trinomac and Auriel tried to destroy the heart of Lorcan, it laughed at them. It said, This heart is the heart of the world, for one was made to satisfy the other. So Auriel fastened the thing to an arrow and let it fly long into the sea, where no aspect of the new world may ever find it. The heart hit the sea, and in its place, Red Mountain emerged. The heart of Lorcan is this tower's stone. The next tower was the Tower of White Gold. The Aelids of the Heartland built their tower in open emulation of Adamantia, using as the founding stone the great red diamond they had uncovered, Kimel Adabal. The White Gold Tower was not the only tower built as a mirror to the Adamantine Tower. There was also crystal-like law, the Crystal Tower of Somerset, powered by a stone known as Transparent Law. Then there's the Snow Tower, the throat of the world in Skyrim. This tower stone isn't common knowledge. Non-canon sources claim the stone is actually a cave. Next, we have the Green Sap Tower of Valenwood, which is a colossal grot oak tree grown by the Bosma. According to the Orbic Enigma, the stone of this tower is the perchance acorn from which the tower germinated. The Orichalc Tower is the most mysterious of all, as it is believed to be the only tower not located on the continent of Tamriel. It is believed this tower sank along with Yakuda, and its secrets lie on the bed of the Elpheric Ocean. Michael Kirkbride says the stone of the Orichalc Tower was a sword. Finally, we have the Brass Tower, the Dwemer Numidium. So, if the Old Mary Dominion secretly wishes to undo creation, they would need to gain control of all eight towers, and they would need to destroy the eight stones. The Numidium was demolished during the Miracle of Peace. The Orichalc Tower sank into the sea. The Green Sap Tower is located in a province controlled by the Old Mary Dominion. The Crystal Tower is of course in Somerset, and the Ultima control it already. The Nerevarine prophecy saw the heart of Lorcan leave the world. That's five towers accounted for. The Falmor are actively working to destroy the Empire, even if a precarious truce exists between the two factions. Taking the Imperial City will give them the White Gold Tower. The Dominion are also heavily involved in Skyrim's civil war, and in pushing north into Hammerfell. It may be a coincidence, but it looks as though the Aldma are working their way toward the remaining towers, and it may not be long before they have control of all the stones. The question is, will it return them to Aetherius and the company of their Adric ancestors? Will achieving their goal grant them immortality? That much remains to be seen in the Elder Scrolls VI. And there you have it guys, the comprehensive guide to immortality in the Elder Scrolls. You could become undead, subject yourself to a dangerous disease, or undergo pagan rituals. You could devote your life to studying the magics of the Sijic and the Telvanni. You could change your identity and become an existing god. You could even lucid dream and take existence by the scruff of the neck. Or you could just destroy the world. Which path would you follow? I hope you enjoyed the video guys, thanks so much for watching. My name is Drew, this is Fudge Muppet, and I'll see you in the next one.